Hello from the offices of the Taunton Daily Gazette and welcome to this third Bristol House District debate and editorial board meeting. I'm Aaron, I'm Aaron Frechette, editorial page editor, and I'll be moderating today's debate and leading the discussion. Today's session is twofold. One is to provide the candidates with an opportunity to interact, challenge each other, and present their case directly to the voters and to the editorial board. And two, for the purpose of helping to determine the editorial board's endorsement in this race. This will be about a 90-minute forum in total. The first hour will be an interactive Lincoln-Douglas-style debate where Councilor Costa Hanlon and Representative Shauna O'Connell will be able to make opening statements to introduce themselves and why they're running, their vision, and a little bit about themselves. In the interest of time, we've asked the candidates to limit their questions to one minute. Their responses uh, will be limited to two minutes, and any requested rebuttals, uh, or rebuttals to rebuttals, will be one minute. We realize it's a debate, but we do ask the candidates to be polite and respectful of each other as much as possible. Now, after the Q&A, each candidate will have an opportunity to offer their two-minute closing statement. Now, followed by the debate portion, the candidates will then be asked a series of questions by members of our panel, including follow-up questions that were left unanswered or arose from the debate. In the endorsement meeting portion, the candidates are expected to be respectful of one another and address the board rather than each other. The segment is intended to be issue-oriented and conversational rather than confrontational in nature. So now with all those housekeeping matters out of the way, I'd like to introduce the candidates. On the right appropriately, we have incumbent Republican uh, Representative Shauna O'Connell, and on the left appropriately <laughs> is her Democratic challenger, City Councilor Sherry Costa Hamlin. And thank you very much for joining us today. Now on our panel, we're joined by Associate Publisher and Editor-in-Chief Lisa Stratton. I'm Aaron Frechette, editorial page editor. Next to me is assistant city editor Jerry Tuoti, and city editor Rory Schuler is at the end of the table. Now, uh, we also have some members of the editorial board who are not with us here today, but will be uh, viewing the video and will be part of our deliberation process. And we'd also like to thank our friends at TCAM who have been good enough to record today's debate and will be airing it over the course of the next week on TCAM. Uh, this video will also be available on TaunttonGazette.com. We held a coin toss to determine who will go first, and the winner was Sherry Costa Hamlin, who offered to open the second opening statement, so Representative O'Connell will take the first opening statement. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to start by saying that it has been my deepest honor and privilege to serve as state representative for my hometown of Taunton. I am a lifelong Tauntonian. I've had all of my first great experiences here, went through the school system here, had my first job here uh, right over at the old mall where we used to have Blitz and Rite Aid and I worked at both at the same time. I bought my first home here and I'm very proud to be raising my own family in the town where I grew up. I care very deeply about this community and since being elected I have worked very hard to make a positive difference at the State House for all of our families and to be a representative that the city of Taunton can be proud of. When I ran for office, I made some promises to you, and I've kept those promises. I promised to be full-time and to be accessible, and I've done that by holding regular office hours and meeting with you when you need me. And I also promised to opt out of the pension system and refuse to take per diem pay, and I've done that as well. I want you to know that for me, this is about service. But most importantly, I promise to always put Taunton first, and I've done that. I have stood up and fought for you against the status quo when no one else would, and I've won. I've continued to be active in the community on a personal level and with my family, and stay in close touch with you. I've never stopped knocking on doors and listening to you, even when it was not an election year. I've worked very hard to earn your trust and be responsive. And I've been truly humbled and honored by the support I've received from this community, and I'm very thankful. Thank you. Thank you, Representative O'Connell. Councilor Costa Hamlin. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the Taunton Gazette. Thank you to Representative O'Connell for agreeing to this debate, and thank you to TCAM for broadcasting it. I'm Sherry Costa Hamlin. I'm a city councilor. I'm a downtown business owner, and I'm asking for your vote for state representative on November 6th. And in asking, I think you should know a little bit about myself. I will tell you that I grew up, I, I was born on North Pleasant Street, and I currently live with my husband and two children in Whittington, so I guess in Taunton standards, I'd be considered a social climber. Um, 
I have been a downtown business owner for almost 15 years. I've met a payroll, so I understand the challenges of small business. Um, I worked my way through college, and when I say I worked my way through college, I think you should know what that means, because words matter. I held a full-time schedule. I worked in the dining commons, and I worked as a waitress my way through college and through law school. Um, I am running because I feel like we need a business perspective on Beacon Hill. I have, as I said, I've met a payroll, I've made tough decisions, and I think growing our small business is the most important thing we can do. Right now, um, my, my philosophy is this. Government cannot create private sector jobs, but it can create the environment for them to grow. And we haven't been doing that on Beacon Hill, and it shows. It shows here in Taunton because our uh, jobless rate and our unemployment rate are higher than the state average. I think we need somebody with a clear business voice that will go to Beacon Hill, that will fight for jobs, that will improve all of us. That's why I'm asking for your vote on November 6th. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, Representative O'Connell will ask the first question. Okay. Um, Sherry, you say that you are business friendly. But according to the mass family survey that you filled out, you are against returning the sales tax to 5% and support further increasing it. Um, this hurts vulnerable people, seniors living on a fixed income. You are also supported by NASW. They advocate for higher taxes. Uh, will you make your NASW survey public so we can see what other taxes you've agreed to raise? I have not, if I just, I have not agreed to raise any taxes, and I actually have a record, not just endorsement questionnaires, but a record on the city council. When I was asked to raise taxes on commercial property, which is over double, I voted no on the tax rate every time I was asked. I have a record on voting against the, tr the trash tax. I did vote for the local option for the meals tax when former when former Mayor Charles Crowley asked it of all the city council because quite frankly, we were dealing with devastating cuts to local, to local aid from the state house, from people in the legislature like you. So when, when Mayor Crowley asked me, that's what I did. I am, am happy to discuss any of my questionnaires. Those questionnaires, as you know, are not mine. They are, they are asked of us from those organizations and they keep them private. So I don't understand your question. It really doesn't make sense. And anyone that's gone through this process knows it doesn't make sense. Um, the Family Institute that I filled out, I will tell you, and I, and I have another um, questionnaire that I filled out for new jobs of, of Massachusetts. The questions were asked, would I agree to roll back the sales tax? I said I would not roll back the sales tax. I would like to look into reducing the income tax and possibly increasing sales tax if we did that. That's not a liberal, that's not a liberal position to take. I, I think you will all remember that when Mr. Forbes ran for president, that was one of his that was one of his one of the things that he offered for tax relief was to to uh, pare down the income tax and then increase the sales tax. That's all and the question I was asked, I said I would not. I would not roll back the sales tax. That doesn't mean I'm increasing it. That means I'm keeping it where it is. And I understand that we need some of that sales tax so that we can help local, the local tax base because we are in desperate need of maintaining critical services. Um, you do have a record of increasing taxes. You voted to increase taxes in 2008 on the city council in 2009. And you say you did that under duress because local aid was cut. Um, however, I was not elected in 2009, so that was the previous representative that uh, was on watch at that time. And I've been endorsed by New Jobs for Massachusetts, not you. Also, um, you, it says right here, I'd rather see an increase in the sales tax right on the survey. So you said that in that survey, and you said in another survey that you want to raise the income tax. So you need to come clean with your surveys and let them out and let the voters know what it is that you said. Again, the surveys are totally separate. Those surveys, are, and, and I would like to know how you get a copy of the surveys because from the letters that I got, those are supposed to be independent and they're not supposed to be coordinated with any campaign. So it's interesting that your campaign would have a copy of that, but I guess that's something for a legal matter later on that we can discuss. But I am happy to tell anybody where I stand. And it's not a survey. I never said that you 
that you were in the legislature when the uh, when local aid was cut. I never said that. Please listen to what I said. I said the legislature did that. I never said you did. But I was on the council then. I've been on the council for over five years, and I understand what that means. And it, and I understand what it means when you are struggling to maintain police and fire and teachers, and you're counting on that money to come down. And you, in fact, voted for a budget in 2011, on, in April, the first budget that came out of the House of Representatives that cut local aid. Now, later on, two months later, they were able to restore some of it. But that first vote that you cast would have devastated us. And Charles Crowley is, is actually quoted in this paper in June of 2011, saying, as mayor, that the budget you voted for in the House of Representatives would devastate us, and he, he blamed the governor and the legislature. And you were in the legislature in 2011. So that's a responsibility for you. Thank you very much. Uh, you're uh, sure, I'll allow a response. Okay, thank you. Um, the only reason that local aid was restored in 2011 because, was because of an amendment that I sponsored with my colleagues. Um, that House budget local aid was cut by the Democratic Party, and my colleagues and I sponsored an amendment uh, to return $65 million in reversions to cities and towns. The only reason Taunton got $514 million that year to level fund their local aid was because of the amendment that I supported. Um, Charlie Crowley said that he never asked me to vote against that budget and said that you were grandstanding and were not being truthful when you said that. Care to respond to that? I really do. That's not what I said. That's, you, you really need to stop misrepresenting the record, okay? I said that in this newspaper, Charlie Crowley in June of 2011 said the budget that you voted for, not the amendment, the original budget, Shauna, that you voted for in April contained cuts. And again, this is a disconnect. You can talk about two months later, and, and that was a great amendment. What you did is you, the amendment stated that if there was money left over from the lottery, then monies would come back to local aid. That's rolling the dice. You should have stood up for that first budget and said, you are cutting local aid, this is devastating. That's what you should have done. And I never said that Charlie Cro I never said that we had asked you not to vote for that budget. We'd asked you not to support the cuts to Taunton State. So please stop misrepresenting. You it's said yesterday true. that you it's, asked me not I, to vote for please, that budget. Can I please finish? Um, finish it up so and then. Yeah, I just want to finish this up because it's very important. There's a serious disconnect. When you vote for a budget in April, we at the local level start dealing with our budget. So when you, when you vote for that, we need to send the pink slips out. It's great when you give us the money later on, but we are dealing with that budget now. And there's a serious disconnect for what happens in Beacon Hill and what happens down here at City Hall. Uh, and well, one more response for the sake of discussion, then we have to move on. Um, Charlie's uh, comments were in April, not June, so you're wrong right there. And that money does not come back from the lottery. So you didn't understand reversions last time we talked about it. You still don't understand reversions, and you don't understand how to fund local aid when it's cut by the Democratic Party. Are we ready to move on? Sure. Thank you. Uh, your question, please, uh, Councillor Costa Hamlin. Um, so this kind of dovetails on this. Um, considering that the April budget, the April 2011 budget that came out of the House, contained cuts for local aid, devastating cuts, that again, in the newspaper, June of 2011, Charlie Crowley was quoted in this newspaper, and you can look it up. You can look up the article. It was not April. It was June 2011 he said this. June 7th, I believe. Considering, knowing now what you know, what those devastating cuts meant to the city of Taunton, the pink slips that went out to the police, the pink slips that went out to fire, pink slips that went out to the teachers, would you now have voted against that April 2011 budget? That budget had local aid cut by the Democrats. I offered an amendment with my party to return local aid to return $65 million to cities and towns. That's why it ended up being level funded. Um, I have been a fighter for local aid. Local aid in the city has increased in the past two years that I've been elected. Chapter 70 has increased. Chapter 90 has increased. Uh, transportation for um, funding for student transportation has increased. So I've been a fighter for local aid, and I will continue to be a fighter for local aid. Will you answer? The question was, in April, not two months later, 
You're saying that in April that was a Democratic budget, but you still voted for it. Would you take back that vote? Would you stand on the floor now and say, no, I would not vote for that budget? I would stand on the floor and fight for more local aid like I did the last time. But you voted for the budget. I would stand on the floor and fight for more local aid and get more local aid like I did then. That, I, again, that's simply, that's simply not true. But we can move on. You voted for a budget in April. You just admitted that restored that five hundred and fifteen fourteen thousand dollars in funding. Please, that April budget that came out—that's a Democratic budget. So you're telling me you still weren't even willing to stand up against a Democratic budget? You're saying that Democratic budget contained local aid cuts, and you still voted for it? Why didn't you stand up? Senator Pacheco voted. He's a Democrat. He voted against that budget in April. He's a Democrat. He was able to stand up for this district and say no. Are you, and you're telling me today you would still vote for that April budget? That I'm telling you today that I will stand up again and support more local aid like I did then. Will you okay. vote? Okay. Uh, can we move on uh, to Representative O'Connell's question? Do you support Melissa's bill? I do support Melissa's bill. You do support Melissa's right. bill. Um, which is a little bit surprising because according to your project Vote Smart, um, you ask for more judicial discretion in, in sentencing three-time offenders, which would completely gut Melissa's bill, and which was what the governor wanted to do after we passed it and we overrode. Representative, would you explain what Melissa's bill is for our viewers? Oh, sure. sure. Um, my apologies. Melissa's bill is a violent offender law. Um, it's sometimes referred to as a three strikes law. So if you are a violent offender and have committed three criminal violent crimes, um, you will go to jail for the time that you have been sentenced with no um, chance of parole. And it came about as a result of um, Melissa Gossel being killed, um, brutally killed. It sat on Beacon Hill for 10 years languishing before we could finally get it passed this year. And uh, it was also a result of another officer um, on the North Shore being killed recently by a violent offender that should have been in jail and was let out of jail. So that's a good, you know, crux of what it is. Uh, and your question again to, to the counselor. Um, you put in your survey that you support um, judicial sent, uh, discretion in sentencing. Okay. And that completely guts Melissa's bill. It absolutely does not. It absolutely does not. And again, you know, we all need to understand that you can support a bill and still think that there needs to be reasonable changes. There needs to be reasonable changes. That doesn't absolutely gut Melissa's bill, and you know that. It does. No, it absolutely does not. It allows, it allows judges to look at the totalitarian of the circumstances, and it also, and this is very important, allows prosecutors who may not want to put um, someone on the stand or May, may want to be able to actually put someone behind bars and not take the chance that they could walk. It allows them some discretion. And I, I trust our judges. I certainly trust the, our district attorney and, and their staff. It gives them a little bit of latitude. It does not gut that bill. It actually gives us a peace of mind to know that the people that work there every day, not just legislators up on Beacon Hill, but our, our elected our elected um, district attorneys and their staff who deal with this every day and the judges who deal with this every day will be given an opportunity to perhaps put someone behind bars who may, through no fault of their own, perhaps as we all know about the, the scandal we're dealing with with the drug lab, perhaps through a procedure, through process, may go free. So it provides them that opportunity and it really is an opportunity to maybe actually get someone behind bars instead of seeing them walk free because of a technicality in the law. So I do support it, but I don't think it guts Melissa's law. And well, you shouldn't think it either. Okay. Uh, well, the fact of the matter is that once we pass Melissa's bill, um, the governor tried to gut it by putting in more judicial discretion. The, the whole purpose of the bill is to ensure that violent repeat offenders stay in jail. Um, and the governor was the only one that wanted to gut Melissa's bill. He sent it back with the changes that you want to see in it, That's and right. we overrode what he did, and we passed it anyway. And the DA's support 
what we pass. They do not support your stance on judicial discretion. You're weak on crime. You are not tough on crime. And the last thing we need is another lawyer defending criminals up on Beacon Hill. Excuse me. Stop representing, misrepresenting my case. Please stop. I know you want to run against Jim Fagan, but I'm not Jim Fagan. I'm not a criminal attorney. I've never been a criminal attorney. But I do understand the legal system obviously much more than you do. I, the fact that I said they needed a little bit more discretion has nothing to do with what the governor said. Absolutely nothing. His bill absolutely did gut it. I agree. And I would not have supported that. But I'm not the governor. And try as you might, you're not going to pin me to what he wants. No matter how many times you say it, Shauna, you're not going to be able to pin me. I know who I am. You have no, you have no evidence, you have no basis in fact to call me weak on crime. You have no basis at all. You, you're just throwing out these, these accusations based on one, one response to one question. How many questions are invoked, Smart? Do you remember how many questions they asked? You I would out say there's about 50 questions, and you're going to choose one to try to gain your political ground when you have no basis of knowing. All the questions you answer are the questions that you answered, and the, the voters have a right to know Absolutely. how and that's you're why answering these questions. Absolutely, and that's why it's published, and yours isn't, because you don't answer it, do you? You don't, unlike me. You're not willing to put out your, what you stand for. You're not willing to participate in Vote Smart. And that's sad. Because what you do is you take all these little questions and you turn them around instead of you standing up and letting the voters know where you stand on all these issues. I, but support, again, I supported Melissa's bill. Um, I supported it passing. I supported the tough version of Melissa's bill that keeps criminals behind bars. And people know my votes. I've voted on these things. I have a record of it. Excuse me, but the question was to me. And, and again, I want, what is your evidence that I am weak on crime? Because I'm an attorney? Because I'm an attorney, I'm weak on crime? That is really disrespectful to every voter out there that you would misrepresent. And it's really, you know, with all due respect, it's really a tactic that we're all tired of. We're tired of this kind of, this kind of um, us and them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and lying or misrepresenting to get a word up. It's absolutely inappropriate. And no one here wants it. Okay. Your question was you know, to me. You're really letting her demagogue here, I think. Yeah. Please go. I'm, I'm trying to facilitate a discussion so okay. that we okay. can, you know, discuss the issues on the table and, and get an answer. So, um. Okay, so. You know, you answered the question. I and did on the Voter Smart Project, and the people have a right to know that you want to gut Melissa's bill, it's and not, that's what it's doing. Are that's we ready to true. move on to the next question? Okay. Uh, so the next question is to uh, Councillor Costa Hamlin. Please ask. Sure. Um, considering, so this is actually, and thank you for this opportunity, because I actually have a lot of questions from constituents also. I've been going door to door, as everyone knows. So a lot of these questions are also from people that I've spoke to out in the field, not just mine. Um, there's a woman I spoke to at, on Bay Street whose son works at Taunton State Hospital, and he's very concerned about the move that's already afoot. He's already been sent to Worcester. So my question to you, Representative O'Connell, is um, before, uh, well, let me back up. In June of 2011, uh, we knew that $27 million was going to be cut out of the state budget, and that $27 million was most likely Taunton State Hospital, even though the governor didn't say that. Uh, we knew that that was most likely what the cut was going to be, and you voted for that budget. Now knowing that that money was going to cut Taunton State Hospital, would you still vote? Would you still have voted for that budget? Um, when we vote up there, you don't vote for most likely. You vote for what's in front of you. and. As soon as I got into office, Taunton State Hospital became an issue. And I think it's unfortunate that throughout this whole entire campaign, you've been trying to use it as um, for your own political gain. I've never heard one word from you about Taunton State Hospital until you decided that you could use it to run for office. I immediately met with Mayor Crowley at the time, with the chairman of the board at Taunton State Hospital, with the director of Taunton State Hospital, um, to have a meeting and see what we're going to do about this issue. And it did not get defunded. It did not close in 2011. Um, it is the governor's plan to close the state hospital, and I have been fighting against the governor's plan to co close the state hospital. 
um, you know, if you're that concerned about it, you could have contacted me and tried to work with me about it, and you have never done that. Can I respond to that? Mm -hmm. There is a resolution, and, and I hope I'm in, a, I'm in a room full of reporters. In June of 2011, when I was council president, there was a resolution sent to you, to Representative Haddad, to Representative, um, I believe it was um, Knessa at the time, and Mark Pacheco, a resolution from the City of Taunton Council, Council. It was sent to your office, and I was council president then, saying, and this is 2011, please do not vote, please do not vote for this budget. We believe it's going to defund Taunton State Hospital. So to say that you didn't receive anything, and this is 2011, is simply not true. Now, I know you've said before that you only casually watch city council meetings. So perhaps this is another disconnect. Had you watched city council meetings, you would have heard Mayor Crowley talk about the fact that that $27 million most likely is for Taunton State Hospital. You would have heard that as council president, I sent out a letter that went to the governor, that went to the um, executive director of, of uh, Health and Human Services talking about that. So please don't misrepresent my record. I have been sure. fighting since sure. 2011. Sure. This is not this is not a stepping stone. This is your record. This is I your am, record on Taunton State Hospital. I am very proud of my record of working on Taunton State Hospital. Um, since I was in office, it has been an issue. Since I've been in office, I've been fighting for this issue. That budget did not defund Taunton State Hospital. Those are the facts. And I said you never contacted me, and you've never contacted me to work with me together on this issue. Um, I've attended meetings. I've attended rallies. I've written letters. I've signed letters. I've met with the nurses. I have a meeting tomorrow with employees of Taunton State Hospital to talk about what's going on there. Um, so, you know, to say that I haven't worked on the issue is just untrue, like many of the other untruths that you've been tell talking about, about my record. Can I just a follow up? Quickly. There were three meetings scheduled for representatives around Taunton State Hospital. Meetings in other in, in the Speaker Pro Tem's office, three mm -hmm. of them, with the Executive Director of the Department of Mental Health to talk about Taunton State mm -hmm. Hospital. You did not attend any of those three meetings. And that's when the work really starts. The work starts right yeah. before then. So I'm not misrepresenting. The truth is the truth. Yeah. I, yes, I have been to every meeting except for one where, unfortunately, I had the flu and was unable to attend. You know, but if you want to talk about misrepresenting, you know, you're misrepresenting on the sales tax. Okay, we're talking about Taunton State Hospital, so I just want to keep it on that issue um, just to keep it focused. But um, you have another question coming up now, so uh, please feel free to pose it. All right. Do you know what SEI used? number one issue was this year? SEIU, there's so many SEIUs. There's, there's 1199, there's 509, there's SEIU, I mean you should understand this. Right. SEIU has... The ones that are supporting you. SEIU has a number of, mm -hmm. of issues, so... SEIU you are supporting you. They're supporting the you, so... Can you just tell us what SEIU sure. stands for? Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's, okay. it's, a, it's an employees union and State Employees Union, and their number one issue, I'll tell you what it was, was unionizing daycare this year. Um, do you agree with unionizing home daycares? That's, which SEIU are you talking about? Because it wasn't statewide, so you really don't okay. understand what you're talking about. I'm sorry. SEIU. Which local are you talking about? What number this are you is talking the question. about? This is the question. I'm asking the question right now. This is the question. SEIU uh, helped to unionize home daycare this year. Do you agree with unionizing home daycare? Private daycare, yeah. They, the, the issue that, the rep, that Shauna is talking about, and she, she doesn't understand which SEIU it is, but there, there was a, one of the SEIUs was looking to have large family private daycare facilities give their employees the option of creating a union, just like they did at one hospital, same thing, not forcing them into a union, not forcing them, okay, but giving them an option to unionize. I don't think it is an, I don't think it, it defeats anyone's purpose to give anyone the option to unionize. It is, it's just fair. To allow them to be able to unionize is fair. 
So even though you really want, weren't too sure on which SEIU was, um, I believe, I don't want to put words in your mouth, and it is your question, but that's what I believe the issue was. So, did so it is small private family daycares, a lot of stay-at-home moms that do daycare that want to stay home and help support their families, and they are forced to, to unionize because if they accept vouchers, the money comes directly out of the vouchers whether or not they join the union. So do you support forcing them to unionize? It's not forcing. It is giving them the option. It's not an option when they take the money directly out of the vouchers. And they don't have to. They don't they, have they to take do. the vouchers. Well, no, no they you're right, because then they won't listen. take the vouchers. Excuse me. They won't take the vouchers, and then that will cause the family daycares to lose money, and it will cause um, families that are looking for affordable daycare um, to lose that option of affordable daycare. So it's not a win-win for anyone. I it's going to hurt hard-working families. It is, a, and it is a choice. And it I is anti-business. You're just no, not business-friendly. Business I'm sorry. Business people do not need your stewardship or Beacon Hill. We understand what we need. I have, I have an option every, all the time to take federal or state money to improve my business. I don't like the strings that are attached, so often I don't. But there are millions of business people that do like the strings attached, so they do it. We don't need people like you telling us what we need to do, okay? We are small business owners. We know what we need to do and how we need to compete. And every single time you take government money, there's a string attached. And that's the truth. And that is the right. truth. So you're just talking about everything that happens every day when any small business person wants to get into the government, you know, when they want to be able to use that subsidy. It's like Section 8, right? Landlords don't have to take Section 8, but if they do, they have regular inspections, they have these standards that they have to take, but they don't have to. They, sometimes they want it to keep that steady income. So. I, you know, it, it's unfortunate. Do you care to respond to any of this? Or? So. Stay at home working moms are being forced to unionize. That's okay. not giving them a choice. And if they don't, they're going to lose um, their clients and there's going to be less available, affordable, available daycare for, for other working parents. Um, unions are telling you what to do because they're supporting you. And the reason unions are supporting you is because you support higher taxes. So what taxes did you say you would agree to raise by getting the are SAIU you, are you endorsement? Talking, are we talking back on the issue? The issue was daycare. the daycare and, and right. supporting state employees, or rather supporting the unionization of home daycare employees. Right. That's what the I mean, issue is. Are we? And the issue is that you're also supported by SEIU. And you got that support somehow. I, I got something. that support. You know, let's be honest. I think part of the reason I got that support is because you failed them at Taunton State Hospital. Just like I have the support of the Mass Nurses Association because you failed them at Taunton State Hospital. I could go on and on and on. I, you know, I don't bargain as a city councilor and certainly as a private business owner. I have never had to do anything with FCIU. Okay? They're not expecting anything of me. What they know is that you didn't fight for the jobs at Taunton State Hospital. That's why the Mass Nurses Association is supporting me and not supporting you. That's probably why SEIU is supporting me and not supporting you. Because you didn't fight for them when they needed it. So don't, don't make it about they think that they're going to get something out of me. That, that's not what it is at all. They just know that you haven't been fighting for them at Taunton State Hospital when they Quick response, and then I'd really like to move on. For the employees and the patients at Taunton State Hospital, mm -hmm. and all the unions do support you because you have agreed to raise taxes. That's not the unions support you, the Coalition for Social Justice supports you, NASW supports you, and that's because those are people whose number one goal it is to raise taxes, and they know that you're going to raise taxes, and you should let out your NASW survey so that we know what taxes you agreed to raise. Listen, this is absolutely ridiculous. Just because you are a one-issue person doesn't mean all of those organizations are too. They care about so many other things, and you know it. And you're just trying to spin this because those people support me because you haven't done the work in this district that we all deserve. That's the only reason. That is the only reason. And I'm sorry for that, and that's not my issue. That is your record, and you have to live with it. I'm sorry. I am very proud that's of the work I have done the past two years you for this district. I have worked very hard, and 
all the voters and the viewers out there know. You can disagree, but but that's why they're supporting me. And you know it as well as I do. I appreciate you the vigorous debate. Just... I appreciate the vigorous debate. I'd like to move on to the next question, if we may. And that goes to Representative, uh, to uh, Councillor Costa Hanlon, please. That goes to me? Your question you just said, to Oh, okay. Because you said that goes to me. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. Um, so moving on from Taunton State Hospital, the commuter rail is a major issue. Um, when you and I were on the radio, you said that you, and, and you did support an amendment to the budget, and you signed um, the amendment to freeze M MBTA spending, which would have absolutely stopped the commuter rail in its tracks, pardon the bun, um, from coming down here. Absolutely stop it. That's what that, that bill is for. And when we were on the radio debating that, you said you agreed with stopping it because it was $1.8 billion and you thought that the costs were too high. Yet, when you were in front of the governor just last week and they were talking about the South Coast Rail and the governor asked everyone in the room, is everyone okay with this? You said you were only concerned about the environmental impact in Eastern, which I actually agree with you on. But now, so now are you telling people that you're for the commuter rail? Because you didn't stand up to a lame duck Democratic governor and say, no, Mr. Governor, I think it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. You didn't do that then when you had the opportunity. So are you now for the commuter rail? Um, once again, you are just lying to the folks out there and distorting my record, and I, I think it's pretty shameful. From day one, I have been supportive of the commuter rail. I testified in favor of the commuter rail uh, in 2011. And when we were talking to the governor, I did, I did voice my concerns about Easton because Easton is now part of the district. And I also asked the governor if he's going to have a better cost estimate for us in March when um, the report comes in. So I did talk about the cost. What I think we need to do, and what that amendment did, it, it didn't stop the commuter rail in, a track, in its tracks. It said, look, let's be fiscally responsible. Let's be responsible with the taxpayers' dollars, and let's make sure that we know we have a better cost estimate of this, we know how we're going to pay for this, and we know what revenues are going to be returned. Um, we all know what dire financial straits the MBTA, MBTA is in right now. Uh, we've just had to help them along. They need to continue to do some reform so that they are on better uh, ground. So before we embark on a multi-billion dollar project, and I have to say, you thought it was a million dollar project when we were on the radio. You said million, and I do have the transcript. A multi-billion dollar project. We need to assure the taxpayers that we're not going to get a quarter of the way done or halfway done and say, oh, I'm sorry, we're going to have to go and reach in your pocket again to pay for something when we could have had it straightened out before we embarked on the project. And just in response, there and anyone here can look at the detailed studies for the commuter rail to this area. They started over 20 years ago. Over 20 years ago. These studies even include a rapid bus <laughs> option, okay, to have a rapid bus option. So this is not willy-nilly. Just because Shauna just got into the State House, it doesn't mean this is when they just started talking about the commuter rail. This is a very detailed study. They know the costs. They know the costs. They understand the costs. And let's be honest with everyone. It costs $1.8 billion, and maybe I did make a mistake and said million, but I understand it's $1.8 billion. But let's all be honest with, with ourselves. Every other commuter rail throughout this Commonwealth used the tax dollars of the city of Taunton and the people of this area to get them there. And I don't begrudge anyone. I'm happy Arboro has their commuter rail. I'm happy Lakeville does. But you know what? What about us? $1.8 billion is a lot of money, but I think we deserve it. I really do. And our tax money has been going up 24 long enough that I think it's only fair it comes back down here. It will create jobs. It really will create jobs. In your response, Sean? I think that that study will show that um, we should have the commuter rail, that it will be a benefit to the city of Taunton, but we have to do it the right way, not by using 20-year-old studies. And as a matter of fact, this amendment passed in the Senate. Um, I'm not going to keep allowing the rebuttals because it's okay. kind of gotten out of hand. That way I wanted to have a conversational approach here. Sure. Um, but it, it's, it's getting hard to keep track. I, don't, I want to be fair to everyone. Mm -hmm. And so I'd just like to keep it to the, the format that sure. it is. 
I'm just trying to say one thing. The study that the last study that was done was done in depth study done in 2009, so it wasn't 20 years old, and it was updated to 2012. And part of the reason it costs so much money is because of the big dig. The, the federal, we cannot get any federal money because of the mistakes made in Boston, and I'm tired of us down here paying for those mistakes. We deserve the commuter rail. Um, we're ready to move on to uh, your question for, uh, for Sherry. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, small business groups will tell you that the number one reform that they want to see is less mandates and more options in health insurance to make it more affordable, and so they can offer their employees more plans. Um, would you vote for or against allowing small businesses to have options on their health insurance coverage? Well, this is my concern. What are they getting back? We all know, you know, insurance companies are in business. If they're giving small business people options, what are they taking off the table? If they're taking off the table keeping health care for people who have pre-existing conditions and anything that is going to hurt working class families to keep their sick children and their sick uh, parents, then I don't think I would support it. If it's a reasonable and we're not giving up what we have hurt, what we have fought very hard to get in this state, then I wouldn't. I would not allow that to be done if it means that they're going to then ask us to come back and walk back from, you know, making sure that all children are covered and, and, and are covered um, all the way up until they're through college. Or if it means that they're going to limit someone's lifetime. Because as we all know, you know, there are people who have catastrophic illnesses and they need that coverage. So if it means taking back some of those things, then no, I would not. I would not support it. But if it can be done reasonably, and the only thing that's being adjusted is what people pay, but that the coverage itself stays, so that we don't have working families concerned about whether their children who may have catastrophic illnesses are covered, then no, that, that's not a fair exchange. It would have to be a fair exchange. I am all for options for everyone, as long as they're not hurting other people. So that, okay, that, that doesn't really come close to answering the question. It doesn't make much sense. The, the, the question is about choice. It's right. about letting employees have a choice and letting employers offer them a choice. So letting them offer coverages, health plans, that have less mandates. And it is the employee's choice to choose a coverage a health care option that has less mandates because they don't want those mandates. We have over 40 mandated coverages in Massachusetts. One of them is in vitro fertilization. I'm sure there's people out there that don't want to pay for that coverage. Uh, do you support having plans that allow them to not pay for those coverages that they don't wish to have? I don't understand. If there's mandates, why don't you take those mandates like the inf why don't you have those mandates removed? Okay, it's a question. Well, this is not, no, you're giving me an example, and you're saying there are some mandates that are unreasonable. Is that what you're saying? And I'm saying to you, to take those mandates off, what is it going to cost? See, I'm a business person, so I know when you take one side, you have to give another. So I'm not going to, if you're asking me about in, virtu you know, in vitro fertilization mandate, my question to you is, if it's mandated and you think, you're, and you're telling me it's mandated by the state, that every health insurance coverage has to cover that, and if you think that is an issue, you should take that out. You, should, you have the power to take okay. out anything that is unreasonable, any, any unreasonable mandate. Instead of doing this whole cookie cutter, you know, we need to take all of the mandates off. Why don't you go to the mandates, like that one, that is probably not used a lot, and why don't you ask for it to be amended? Why I I am not willing to, and nor should you be willing to, have this this cookie cutter approach to everything. Okay, so Thank you, you don't agree with giving a choice to businesses and that's, employees that's not true. if they want to have different levels of coverage. That's it is not their true. choice, and you won't answer the question. You're refusing I, to answer the question. I absolutely You're just don't. not pro business. You don't even. This is the most important issue to business owners out there. Will you help them save, and will you let employees have a choice on what kind of coverage they? The question's want. been the question's been asked. She's had her rebuttals. So, can we move on to the to the next question then? Uh, so it's uh, Councillor Costa Hamlin sure. asking uh, Representative O'Connell. Sure. 
Um, Representative O'Connell, you receive, I believe, um, some kind of stipend for a, a district office. Uh, my question is, why don't you have a full-time office using those funds? I know once a week you're in City Hall, um, but why don't you have a permanent district office, especially considering that you are given a stipend for that? Uh, we are given a stipend for office supplies mm -hmm. um, to use what we need for our offices. And I pay for a lot of stuff for my um, Beacon Hill office, uh, pay for a lot of expenses out of that, and it's not for a district office. Um, it's and only... And how much is that a month? I was told it was $500 a month. Is that...? Uh, no, it's not $500 okay. a month. Okay. Well, I'll have to double check that. Um, so you don't anticipate you'll ever have a permanent office, a permanent district office? I am always available. I hold regular office hours. I do it at City Hall. I do it at other places um, in the evening, Taunton Public Library, um, the Polish Club, so that people have access to me all over the place. I do special office hours for senior citizens. Uh, I meet people at Dunkin' Donuts if they want me to meet them there. I go to their homes. I am always available. I've been a full-time representative holding regular office hours so that people have access to me. I don't believe you've ever held office hours as a city council. I have. I have. Okay, sure. I, first of all, I asked, will you have a permanent office? And obviously the, the answer is no, so that's fine. I am a city councilor, and I have a, a downtown business office. I meet people there all the time, all the time. I meet people just like you do in their homes. And actually, that's not my full-time job. As you know, I have a full-time job. I'm not a full-time legislator, okay? So I have an office. People come to my office. But I'm proud of the people that I sit with on the city council. And one of them, David Pottier, happens to, have, you know, happens to work in Boston. He doesn't have office hours either because he has a, a, a steady job. So we as councilors, you're right. Tommy Hoy never did because we have people meet us wherever we are. We don't get stipends for our offices. We work just as hard, but we also have full-time jobs. So that's why. Care to move up? Or do you want to move up? Yeah, sure. No. Okay, so uh, that, uh, your question to Councillor Costa-Handling. Okay. Um, so I have the support of small business groups. They know my record. I started the Small Business Caucus, um, which you actually made fun of in one of your mailers. I have I a platform from your website. It's about seven lines long. Can you show me where it lists? one of the ideas you have to help the small business community? Sure. I have many. Here's your platform from your website. What is, okay, do you have so a question for me? Yes, I said, can you show me where it lists one idea to help the small business community? My platform doesn't have to, but I can. Are you asking me? I'd be happy to tell you. There are two things that I would really like to do for small business, and we talk about it all the time. We have cookie cutter regulations. They don't make sense, okay? I'm a small business owner. I've been a small business owner for almost 15 years. Do I believe in regulations? Absolutely, we need regulations. Look at New England Compound, right? Isn't that a tragedy? People are actually dying. But what I'd like to see is regulations that fit what you're doing. So if you are manufacturing something that could kill someone, or in your manufacturing process or anything you do has the potential to cause serious harm, yes, you should be regulated, but not me. So what we need to do is take all those designations. When I, form up, when I fill out my Schedule C, trust me, the federal government puts me in a category for all of my small businesses, just like they do every small business person. We are categorized by the Department of Labor. Please take that information and use that for regulation. Use what I do, not just because I happen to have a certain amount of employees. That is one thing I would do. The other thing I would do is DCAM, the, the, the uh, Department for Capital Asset Management. A lot of capital projects, unfortunately in this economy, a lot of capital projects have been coming from the public sector. But those capital projects mean money and contracts to our contractors. But the regulations in DCAM keep our contractors out of bidding through no fault of their own. It's just the regulations they have. I understand DCAM needs to protect by bonding but they should give smaller corporate, smaller companies the ability to form their own companies for purposes of bonding so that they can compete too. Right now, and, and, and I don't think it's anything they do purposefully, I just don't think, like, it often happens in Boston. 
often happens in Beacon Hill. They don't understand the implications of the regulations. This isn't the law, this isn't a bill, this is the regulations. So the regulations in DCAM are keeping our smaller contractors down in Taunton from being able to bid on this. And this is something I spoke to with Mr. Carrera. That's something that I would do, and that's meaningful reform, and that will get our people, you know, not, we don't want a free ride. We just want a seat at the table. And I think our contractors could compete with anyone. Can respond, Dr. Yes. So what businesses want to see is uh, less taxes, less regulation, uh, less mandates. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've been fighting for up on Beacon Hill. I started the first ever Small Business Caucus to address all of their concerns. When I first was elected to office, I sent out a survey uh, asking people, asking small business owners, what are the number one concerns you have? One of them was health care. Uh, you don't support giving them the option to lower their health care costs. Okay. Um, in one of your uh, surveys, you support uh, increasing uninsurance, uh, uh, unemployment insurance costs. Um, you want to raise taxes. These are all business killers. You are not business friendly. And I've been supported by the business uh, NF. National Federation of Independent Business, New Jobs for Massachusetts, Citizens for Limited Taxation, because they know my record. They know I'm fighting for jobs in the economy. Um, I've also been awarded the uh, Guardian of Small Business Award uh, for my work on jobs in the economy. And I've been named one of the Grade 8 legislators by the Restaurant and Business Alliance. Out of 200 legislators, one of the Grade 8 for my work at the State House this session. Do you care? Well, absolutely. And I don't... I don't begrudge Shauna any of her accomplishments. But the fact of the matter is, Taunton is still well above the state average for unemployment. So all the things you've been doing has not worked. Taunton State Hospital was on the chopping block. The Taunton Area Chamber of Commerce, top 10 um, employers in, in the city of Taunton, there was Taunton State. But for the Senate, saving those 45 beds that place would be gone because you refuse to stand up and fight for it. So that's one thing. But I will say this. this. I understand what business people want. Not only am I a business owner, I have helped business owners in this district buy and sell small businesses. When I talk about small business, I'm not talking about 14,000 employees. Okay, with all due respect, the NFIB mm -hmm. has never, never endorsed a Democrat. All of those people that you endorse locally or federally have never endorsed a Democrat. The people that I endorse me, the MNA, the Mass Teachers Association, they've all supported Republicans in the past. Even your endorsements are right wing. And it's not fair and it's not right and that's not what we need here. Quickly. Um, NFIB is a nonpartisan uh, they they endorse based on your voting record. And they have most certainly endorsed Democrats. They've endorsed Mike Rodericks right over from Fall River. They've endorsed Jim Timelty. Um, they've endorsed uh, Harriet Stanley. So you're, you're wrong on the facts again. And I've worked with GD to save them jobs recently when they were going to get their cutting fu funding cut. I was the first legislator they contacted and brought attention to that issue and helped to save 100 jobs at GD. Okay, thank you. General thank Dynamics, you. by the way. Uh, we can move on to the next question. Uh, Councillor Costa Hamilton. Sure. Um, this actually was brought to me by one of the, the firefighters here in Taunton. Um, you have uh, spent an awful lot of money on an organization called Tuesday's Associates, of which I believe Holly Robichaud is either the owner or the CEO, and she's also a reporter for the Herald. Um, when Holly uh, reports on you or covers you, do you think she should disclose the fact that you actually that you actually pay her, that she's a paid consultant for you? Well, I think those are questions you need to ask her. I'm sure she follows whatever rules she's required to follow by uh, the Herald. I'm, I'm asking you. Do, do I you think? I just answered you. I, I am sure that she um, reports whatever she's required to by the Herald. So, but do you think it's, it's good policy for her not to disclose that? I have no problem with her disclosing that. And can you, uh, just a follow up to this. Um, the endorsements that you've received, are any of those people, any of those agencies also clients of Tuesday's Associates? Not that I'm aware of. Not that you're aware of. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Does that settle the matter? And if they, and if they were, or do you think that they sh that should be disclosed? By whom? By you. I'm not aware of it. If they were, do you think you should disclose it? I think I need to disclose who I am endorsed by. Okay. 
Thank you. Okay. Uh, we move on to a question from Representative O'Connell. Um, so far, you have refused to say if you're going to take um, per diems or pensions. What is your plan with regard to that? I'm glad you asked that. I will not be taking the pension, but this is why. It's not a political grandstanding move like it is for you. I actually have been a small business owner most of my life. I have put into Social Security. Not only have I put in for myself and the employee part, I've also put in as an employer. So it doesn't make sense for my family for me to take the state pension, because as we all know, that um, will limit my ability to take Social Security later. And I, as I said, I've been, I've been double whacked, as most small business people have, paying both shares of it. So I will not, but not as a political grandstanding point, okay? Um, and I believe that even those people who do take it, Representative, you know, Representative O'Connell, even your colleagues who do, they, they can still have meaningful reform and pension. So for you to say that you have to, that you don't, you're not taking the pension because, you know, you don't think elected officials should do that, I'm hoping that you're not saying that if you take your state pay, that means that you can't make meaningful reform. Because it doesn't matter what you're getting paid. It matters what you can do in your issues. So I most likely will not. But it's not for any political grandstanding. The other thing, I, and the other thing is, my concern is if I don't, if I if I don't take the pension, the state is actually going to have to pay my portion of Social Security. So I'm not sure. Maybe you could help us, but you may actually be causing the tax costing the taxpayers money by not taking the pension because the state now has to still pay into your Social Security. So you should yep. really look at that. But anyway, and the per diem, I didn't even know that there was a per, per diem to drive back and forth to Boston. And that's very unfortunate. Um, and so I will not be taking that per diem. I don't think it makes any sense. But again, it's not public. This is not about grandstanding. It's about common sense things. You know, when the people elect an elected official, when the people send someone to the House of Representatives or the Senate or the governor, there is a package that goes with it. And to say that to not take any piece of that is going to keep people from doing meaningful reform is really not fair. And it's not right. And, it's, and, you, and that's political grandstanding. Yeah. So um, there, there is no political grandstanding. Not taking a pension was a choice that I made because I don't think the taxpayers and my children should be paying my pension years from now. And it's saving taxpayer dollars. And you know, people need to know that it's an option and that uh, legislators can opt out of the pension system. Um, it sounds like you're not taking it because it benefits you to not take it, not because it benefits the taxpayers. And are you taking a pension right now on the city council? Um, I don't think we are allowed to take a pension on the city council. You, you're I in the pension system on the city council, right, no. so you should go down today. You can go down and opt out of that as well. I, I, but you back up here. Actually, that started when I was on the Conservation Commission, so you probably don't understand that. And that was not an option back then. So I have accrued that. It's an but, option to, to but, but let me right back now. up. I'm a part-time employee, what I do. You're right. Your pension would have more implications. You're absolutely right. But what I'm saying about the choice is you should be able to take any, any package that's, that's available to you when you take the job and still be able to make meaningful reform. And I don't understand why you can't. That's, that's your personal choice, too. You're telling me that I'm not taking it for a personal choice. You're right, but you're not taking it for a personal choice also. And let's all be honest. It doesn't mean that the people that are sitting next to you are doing something wrong. It is their option. So to make it a political issue means that you're, you're making people seem like they are, that you are more than they, that you care about people more than they. And that's just not fair. Some people need that. They need that to retire. And so, you know, there are all kinds of things that you should be doing to really save taxpayers money, that really could save taxpayers money. So that's why I say it's political grandstanding. I'm sorry it's, I believe it. No, I believe people should, pay, should save for their own pensions. And you have the ability to go down this afternoon and opt out of the pension system if you say that's what you really believe. And I have been saving the taxpayer dollars. I've been working on EBT reform. I have um, sponsored amendments to do an audit of state land so that we can sell it off and, and get some revenue. I support auditing state credit cards so we know where all that money is going. I have been working on many reforms to save taxpayer dollars. Okay, the next question comes from uh, Sherry Costa-Hanlon to Representative O'Connor. 
Um, I also have, okay. I have one. Um, this is actually from a Taunton police officer. Would you support uh, reinstating the uh, Quinn bill? I support an educated police force. Um, I think our police officers work very hard, and if that came back up, um, I would support that we uh, do help our police officers get more education while they're working for us. Um, what I know that police officers are looking for is more training. Um, their, their funding has been cut for training, and I support reinstating funding and sending more money um, to them so that they can train our police officers uh, and we can have more police officers in the field that are better equipped and better able to fight crime. Would you support reinstating the Quinn bill? It's a specific bill. You understand the bill I'm talking about yes. and all the aspects. Would you support reinstating the Quinn bill is the question. I would yes support no. the Quinn bill. Okay. I'm just surprised, happily surprised. Well, it's been 12 rounds of questions. Uh, we went a little over on some of them for the back and forth. Uh, so I think that'll pretty much wrap up our, uh, this portion of the uh, debate. Um, so the candidates are now uh, entitled to offer their two minute closing statements about why they deserve support from voters and the editorial board's endorsement. Uh, Sean O'Connell opted to offer the final closing statement, so Sherry Costa Hanlon will offer the first closing. And again, I want to thank TCAM. I want to thank the uh, Gazette staff board. I want to thank Shauna for being here. And again, I want to ask people for their vote on November 6th. I will tell you the main reason I'm running in this race is like most people there, I am tired of the rancor that we see every day on the national level, on the state level. I have had the privilege to represent the people of the city of Taunton since 2008 as a city councilor. I was on the Conservation Commission before. I have lived all throughout the state. I've served on the Conservation Commission in South Hadley. I think I bring an awful lot of skills here. But I will tell you what I know in my heart. In my heart, I know that the people of the 3rd Bristol District are not left-wingers. We're not right-wingers. We are moderate people. And we deserve a representative that is a moderate person. Republican, Democrat, Independent, no one faults you for fighting for your district. Unfortunately, right now, we have a representative who almost 98% of the time votes along party lines. That's not from me. That's, that is what's reported in the Beacon, the Beacon call. You can all look it up. That's not who we are. That's never been who we are. We need an independent voice, and it shows that we don't have that. I have been a downtown business owner for almost 15 years. I've met a payroll. Business is important to me, but it's more than a paycheck, okay? My mom was my first secretary, okay? That, though you don't take those days away from you. Small business people have dreams. They build the city, and they need help from Beacon Hill. They need real help, and they need real change. I have been honored to represent a number of small business people buying and smell, selling small businesses right here in Taunton. I know what they care about. They need consumers to come. They need us to fight for jobs. That's what they need. You know, saying you're anti-tax doesn't mean you're anti-fee. So we have people that are hold the line on taxes and they will kill small business on fees. I'm asking you to vote for me on November 6th because I am uniquely qualified as a business owner and as a local elected official to represent this district. And I promise you, that I will not follow any strict party lines in my votes. I will always vote for this district. Thank you. Representative O'Connell, your closing statement, please. Uh, thank you. Um, unfortunately today, Sherry has sat here and told outright lies about my record and hers. Uh, she has done nothing but throw bombs, and she has no plan for time. She has voted to raise your taxes on the city council, and she wants to continue to raise your taxes, as stated in the Mass Family Survey and the Project Vote Survey. She is bought and paid for by special interest groups and unions whose goal it is, whose number one goal, to raise taxes and who want no EBT reforms whatsoever, don't even want to prohibit your tax dollars from being used for buying booze and, uh, and um, cigarettes. You know my record. You know I've been full-time. You know I've been accessible. You know I'm not taking the pensions and per diems. And I've been endorsed by a variety of different groups. 
business groups, NFIB, New Jobs for Mass, Citizens for Limited Taxation, Mass Women's Political Caucus. I've received the Guardian of Small Business Award and been named one of the great eight legislators for my work. I have reached across the aisle and worked with all of my colleagues, including the Speaker of the House, the, House, the Chairman of House Ways and Means, for the benefit of this district. And I've got things done. And my voting record um, is right down the middle. You can try to use whatever numbers you want, but my voting record is 55% with the Speaker. And in the same paper, um, the week before, what Sherry's talking about, there was an article that said my voting record was about 60% with the Speaker. They missed a few votes. When I vote, I vote for Taunton and I vote for you. And I pursued an aggressive agenda this term and I will do the same thing next term. I've stood up to the status quo to fight for local aid, to fight for Taunton State Hospital. Um, I'm going to sit on the commission to assess the necessity to keep Taunton State Hospital here. And you know how hard I work when I sit on these commissions. I am going to continue to lead the Small Business Caucus to pursue opportunities for businesses so we can get them creating jobs and get you back to work. And I will continue to vote against higher taxes and work to ensure that the money that you do pay in taxes is not abused. Uh, it has been a great honor to serve as your representative, and I would be very honored to serve another term as your state representative. Thank you. Thank you, Representative O'Connell. Well, that concludes the debate portion of today's session. Uh, and the panelists and I will now uh, ask follow-up questions for the endorsement uh, meeting portion of our, our meeting today. Uh, I remind the candidates that in this portion, they're expected to be respectful of one another and address the board uh, rather than confront each other, uh, which you had plenty of opportunity to do in the, uh, in the previous segment. Um, so again, this segment is intended to be issue-oriented and conversational in nature. Uh, first of all, are there any questions uh, that any of my colleagues on the panel um, would like to ask? If not, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in with a question. Okay. Go ahead, Derek. Okay. Um, so uh, we had decided by a coin toss that uh, Representative O'Connell would go first in this section. My question um, has to do with the casino issue, and that is while Taunton voters uh, strongly approve the referendum for the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribal Casino, mm -hmm. the process has been anything but smooth. The legislation that gave preference to a tribal casino license in the southeast region had strict, fast approaching deadlines, uh, but did not take into consideration the many hurdles that face the tribal casino. And just recently, another significant roadblock, roadblock appeared in the form of the Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs strong rejection and strong rebuke of the compact between the Mashpees and Governor Deval Patrick. Um, Representative O'Connell, to what do you attribute all of these flaws in the process? Some might say that the tribal casino plan was almost destined to fail. Um, do you think it was destined to fail, or do you still believe that these issues will be worked out? I don't believe it's destined to fail. This is the first time Massachusetts has done anything like this, and um, you know I think people have done the best job they can going along with this casino. Um, it's it's a it's a new experience for everyone who's doing it. I'm disappointed that the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, did reject the compact. Um, we were trying to get the best deal for Massachusetts and for Taunton. Um, we all know that Taunton voted overwhelmingly in support of the casino. Um, I would say it was a fairly fast turnaround with the BIA um, rejecting that. So both sides, um, the governor and the tribe, have agreed to go back to the negotiating table and negotiate further um, a compact with the guidance of the BIA this time um, so that there will be a compact that is accepted. And we continue to have um, con uh, the congressional delegation's support as we go through this process. And I'm going to continue to support Taunton. I think it's uh, an economic opportunity for us to create jobs, to get people back to work. I feel that we are still ahead of the game um, as far as other regions are concerned because we do have a head start um, in our planning and uh, the planning stages. Uh, so as we move forward, I'm going to continue to support Taunton. Okay. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Councilor. So uh, to, I, I'll, I'll ask the question again. To what do you attribute uh, the flaws in the process, and do you think that, that it was destined to fail, or do you still believe that the issues can be worked out for the casino? Um, I, I agree with Shauna. I don't think it was destined to fail. Um, and as, you know, I, I'm an attorney. I'm a business, a business owner. I understand the, you know, the play that goes on here. It's going to be renegotiated. Um, so that's what needs to happen, and, and that's reasonable. Um, is it going to happen as fast as we would want? 
maybe not, but you know, that, that's part of what we need to do. And that's part of the renegotiation. And I will say that, you know, I had the privilege of working on the city part of that, which was the IGA, which is separate from what went on at the state level. Um, I learned a tremendous amount from that. Um, I can definitely hit the ground running if I am elected to deal with, with any issues with the tribal casino. And I will say this, even as a city councilor, um, I, I understood my role as being uh, basically the, the, the person that would make the ultimate decision. Uh, we had, as you know, a very spirited um, campaign here for Vote Yes. And I did not go to either the meetings, the people who were pro-casino and the people who were concerned about the casino. Um, I, I looked at all the facts and I made my own decisions. Um, I know some would talk to the people that were against the casino and hoping to garnish support from them um, and then also be telling the, the people on the other side. I stayed above that political fray and I'm, I'm very proud of that. And I think it's important to note that. So um, I, I do believe that it will be back on track. I believe the state is probably going to have to take a reduction in the things that they were asking. Um, I know from the city side we, we kind of thought that that may be the case, uh, but we put forth our, our best IGA. And um, so I, I would say that I don't think it's destined to fail, and I think we, sh we will be moving forward. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Um, and now I just have a follow-up question. Um, this will be a different question to, to both of you because of your, your positions on the issue. Um, Representative O'Connell, do you regret voting for the Gaming Act and the Compact, um, or do you, or and would you vote differently on either, on, on either of these uh, today? I do not regret my votes. No, um, I think we're moving forward, and I think uh, everyone's working hard to get the job done. Okay. Care to elaborate at all, or does that pretty much answer it? Um, I think that answers it. Okay. Unless you have any other questions. Uh, and Councillor Costa Hamlin, do you regret any role that you played in the process as a city councillor? Um, and if you were in the legislature at the time, would you have voted to support the Gaming Act and the Compact as they were presented? Um, I, as I said, and I, I already talked about that, I'm really proud of, of the role that I had as a city councilor. Our mayor did a phenomenal job. Our city solicitor, the, the law office, did a phenomenal job. We hired excellent counsel, and that's really helped us. Um, I was one counselor. You know, we were asked what we wanted to see in there. I sent back six pages, and, and the mayor said to me, you know, you were the only counselor that when we asked what you wanted to see in there, I sent through six pages. So I understand the process. I did not get all my six pages, but I thought we, we did an excellent job with the IGA. Um, the gaming law, I think uh, the only thing I would say about that, and I am absolutely in support of it, but I really think that they should have defined surrounding communities. I think they could have done a little bit better job with that. I understand some of the, the issues that Easton has. I understand some of the surrounding communities. I'm not saying that that would have been a silver bullet for me, but I think they could have. I think if I was in the legislature, I would have tried a little bit better to define what a surrounding community is so that we all understood, because I think it's caused a lot of um, angst for those surrounding communities, and I understand that. You know, So that, that one thing that I would have done a little bit differently if I was uh, if I was state representative when that came up. Okay. Uh, we'll open up the floor. Who wants to jump in? Go ahead, Roy. I'll go first. This question is for Representative O'Connell. We're not going back and forth. What's that? We're not going back and forth with questions. I, 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 I think you asked the question. Oh, oh, that's right. She yeah, I asked one to. I posed one question to so you to you first. as as our state representative. I yeah. asked the, pretty much the same question to to the counselor mm -hmm. as a counselor. Um, did you have a response that you wanted to? No, no, I'm just saying. Roy is asking now, so right. is, are we going back and forth on who's getting the first question? That's my question. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Please, Roy. On the day the plan to close Taunton State Hospital became public, January 25th. Uh, Sean O'Connell was quoted in a State House News Service story saying that the hospital, quote, has been on the chopping block for quite some time. It may be time we have to face reality that it is going to close at the end of the year. Right. Has your opponent, Representative Sean O'Connell, fought hard enough for the patients and workers at Taunton State Hospital? My opinion is absolutely not, and that's actually one of the main reasons I'm running. Um, and again, I will say, um, Kind of, you know, perception is everything. And when that is in your district, you need to stand up for that district. And you cannot have the powers that be, whether it's a Democratic governor or a Republican governor, think that you are not going to fight for your district. And that is very, very important. So I know, I know that she didn't. 
based on that, the fact that you just said, based on the fact that in June she voted for a budget that she's right. They didn't specifically tell us that $27 million was, was going to cut Taunton State, but we all knew it. And then lo and behold, the next budget, it was cut. And but for the Senate saving the 45 beds, it would be gone. It would be closed. So I don't think she did enough. I, I know she didn't do enough. I believe that's why I have the support, although she's labeling it like they're going to get something back from me for increasing taxes. That's not it at all. They looked to their state representative to fight for Taunton State Hospital, and she didn't. And that's why they're supporting me. And I don't believe that she fought, she fought hard enough. I don't, and I think that's reflected. And my concern is there's going to be another round of fights. There's only 45 beds. There's going to be another round of fights. We need somebody that's going to fight that fight. My other concern is she talks about this committee that she's appointed to. I don't, I don't even think they've met yet. And yet those, those people are already being sent to Worcester. I'm looking in the, in the state register, and there was a, a million, millions of dollar project to repair Taunton State Hospital. Oh, that's been delayed. Gee, why? I mean, follow the money. If you follow the money, you will find every single governor's, uh, what, what their priorities are. You'll know what their priorities are. We knew in 2011 that was a priority. And she should have fought harder, and that's one of the reasons I'm running. Uh, let me rephrase the question slightly to ask Representative O'Connell. Um, I could read the quote back to you, but um, I'm sure you're well aware of the quote. Your critics faulted you for giving up on the major, on a very major employer in the area before your constituents were ready to give up the fight. However, your supporters could argue effectively, perhaps, that you were simply being realistic, that you're being a realist, that um, the closing was and still is inevitable. Uh, as we approach the end of 2012, the hospital seems on its way toward eventual, possibly final closure. Um, however, as the year went on, your tone on this issue seems to have changed. Do you feel you've fought hard enough for this hospital? And can you explain that quote sure. made on the 25th of June? I have fought very hard for this hospital, and the people that work there know it and support me. Um, one sentence does not make a record. Take a look at my record and what I've done since that hospital, um, since the governor has put forward his plan to close that hospital. There has been no budget that has cut the funding of Taunton State Hospital. Um, the budget this year even increased the funding of the Department of Mental Health. Uh, the beds that were saved at Taunton State Hospital were a result of what we fought for in the House uh, first. Then it went to the Senate. Then it went to the conference committee, and we s ended up saving 45 beds at Taunton State Hospital. It was all of us working together. Um, I have been named to that committee, and I have done a press release saying that I was named to the committee, uh, asking that everyone else be named to the committee. I've called the Speaker's office. I've written him a letter. Uh, I've also done the same with the Senate President to ask them to please name all their people so we can get this committee going. I am ready to work on this committee to save Taunton State Hospital. And I think this study is going to show that we need to keep Taunton State Hospital open and that's what I'm going to fight for while I'm on this committee. Um, the reason people are being, some people are being sent over to Worcester is because um, we are only going to have 45 beds at Taunton State Hospital at this point. So some people are being moved, and that's the reason. But if you take a look at my record, um, from 2011, when I very first got in there, I started meeting with Charlie Crowley. I invited them to come and testify at the State House. So I have been working on this since I have been in office. Now, um, people can say what they want, but I have a record. I've attended rallies. I've attended meetings. I've written letters. I've signed letters. I've set up meetings with the Mass Nurses Association, um, with myself, and with high-ranking members on the House Ways and Means Committee when they asked me to. I have been there for everyone. I have a meeting tomorrow with five employees of Taunton State Hospital who called me and said, can you meet with us so we can talk about you know, how we're going to save this hospital? Absolutely. They called me yesterday. I'm meeting with them tomorrow. One of them said, when all this started, Shauna, I called all of the local legislators, and you're the only one who called me back. And that's why she keeps calling me and asking me for support. So I have been there for people. You know, this might not be an issue that gets quite as much um, fanfare, quite as much publicity as it should, but that doesn't mean that I am not working very, very hard on this issue. But can you explain? 
explain your initial response? Because I, I think that's a troubling initial response. Mm -hmm. and, and it may lead people to believe that once you got wind of how big this issue was, that, that you, you changed your position. So why yeah. is that not true? Yeah, I don't think it leads anyone to believe that. I think it's, um, like, look, my, it, so. ex yeah, excuse me. I think it says, look, um, I got a call and I said, you know, that may be a reality. My parents taught me to uh, expect the best, be prepared for the worst. One sentence does not make a record. You need to take a look at my record and what I've done uh, the very next day starting on this issue. Okay. Any other questions related to this? If not, Jerry, did you uh, have a question? Sure. And I believe this question will be going to Sherry Costa Hamlin first. Is that correct? Or is it going to Representative O'Connell? No, I just did first. So yeah. Okay. It's a question for both of you, so I'll pose it to you first, oh. Shauna. On the topic of welfare reform, much of the discussion has centered around a proposal that would eliminate the ability of welfare recipients to get cash benefits. And advocates for such a proposal uh, have argued that it would allow the state to better track and reduce fraud. I believe uh, that has been a position that you've stated. But others, however, have said that access to cash is necessary for some of the recipients to um, go through certain transactions, that uh, certain transactions and expenditures do require cash to change hands. And Governor Deval Patrick has accused some members of the state legislature of grandstanding on the issue. And he has questioned whether EBT reforms are affordable or enforceable. So my question to you is, what is the best way to eliminate welfare abuse while still ensuring that recipients get the benefits that they need? So, you know, you know that I've been working very hard on this issue. and. Um, one of the reasons we set up another commission that we just started working on was to figure out this cash issue. Um, we have passed reforms, and we've said that people cannot purchase certain things with taxpayer dollars. Um, however, if we don't limit access to cash, it is going to be di very difficult for those reforms to be effective. effective. Now, I know that the Gazette did an editorial on this, supporting my positions on um, limiting cash and on the reforms that I've been doing. You know, taxpayers are out there working hard. Nobody minds helping people in need, but we need to make sure that people are using that money appropriately, that children are getting what they need, um, and that it's not being abused. Uh, so, so those are some of the things that I've done. And, you know, we're, we're going forward on the committee to work together and figure out how are we going to do this. Um, the speaker, of, um, the, the speaker wanted to go forward, uh, the chairman of House Make Ways and Means wanted to go forward, and that's why we have this committee set up. This is supposed to be transitional assistance. We should be helping people to get off welfare. If you're on welfare, your goal should be to get off welfare, and your, your actions have to be um, consistent with that. Uh, you should be doing everything you can to help yourself and your family to a better life. And that's what we want. We want people to be able to take care of themselves, to get to a better place in life. So, uh, you know, when people are on welfare, they often get many, many other kinds of assistance. Um, rent, health care, transportation, child care. So we help people a lot. But we can't make it so that they are completely dependent um, they have a completely dependent lifestyle um, on public assistance. And my goal is to um, restore integrity to this program. When the taxpayers see someone buying cigarettes or um, at paying for something at a nail salon with their EBT card, it really drives them nuts. And I think it's very hurtful to the program and to the people that are on it that really need it, that are doing the right things. So um, we are going to go forward and investigate the cash flow system to see how we can in implement it to have a better system that works well for everyone. And do you personally favor a completely cashless system or uh, 
would you be in favor of allowing a certain amount of cash to be withdrawn? I am open. I am open to allowing a certain amount of cash to w be withdrawn. And, and, you know, that's why we're meeting, to see if we can figure that out. Um, I don't have a hard and fast rule right now, but I'm open to what technology is out there that we can use and to what the suggestions are. All right, and the same question to you, Sherry. Would you like me to repeat it? Um, no, I believe I, I understand what the question is, but if I get off track, I'm sure you'll bring me back in. Um, I'm very happy to hear that now Representative O'Connell is open um, to discuss these issues because prior to that, she absolutely was not. And she was advocating for no cash when in fact the MBTA was not even taking EBT, the EBT cards. And, and that is detrimental to working class people. I agree with her that this is supposed to be transitional assistance. But I also recognize in this economy, there are a lot of families that have two and three jobs and still need that extra help because we're just not getting paid what we used to be able to get paid in wages. And in an economy like this, we have a lot more people who are slipping through the cracks. So I agree with her that the, the, you need to be vigilant about it. And I agreed with every step that the House and the Senate took to reform EBT. I disagreed with the governor, and, and Shauna has continued to misrepresent my position on that, even though you know the Gazette was kind enough to, to print in July my stance that I was against the governor's veto of EBT reform. She continues to say that I support EBT reform for people to, to purchase nails. It's simply not true. I know she wishes it was, but it's not. I stood in the same position with the same position with the, the House and the Senate, but I did not agree with Sean with Shauna's position of at that time getting rid of all cash benefits. Now I can see that she's moved off of that position, which makes sense. And she actually brought up some very good points. Going to a cashless system, some thought out of the committee, may even cost the Commonwealth eight million dollars. Because when they when they contracted for the EBT, no one thought about it. They just treated it as a regular ATM card. So I'm glad to see that she's moved more towards the moderate. Because unfortunately what was happening is she was pushing the no cash, no cash. And what we had was a debate on the floor over, all right, if we go no cash, does that mean a man can purchase a, a razor and a woman can't purchase lipstick? That's what the debate was coming down to. Because unfortunately that was just taking it too far. I agree with what she's doing now which is going back to the committee and finding out if we do go to a cashless system, what's it going to cost us? What's it going to mean? And let's talk about the fraud. You know, the numbers are all over the place with fraud. Representative O'Connell sent out a letter in August saying that there was $20 million in fraud in the system. Then her most recent piece said there's $9 million of fraud in the system. I think it's important to know, and we should know, and that's why the EBT cards were, are, so, are so helpful, is you really can track. But, you know, let's talk about what kind of fraud we're looking at and, and having people go after it. I'm a firm believer. We have people on the state payroll right now whose job is to go after fraud. Make them do their job. But don't punish the people who need it. I see people every day. I, see, I spoke to a woman in a homeless shelter. She was in a homeless shelter with her two small children, okay? She was a working mom. She just, they, they couldn't afford housing. She was in a homeless shelter down, down in the Cape, because, but she lived in Brockton. She had a car. She had to make a car payment for it to keep her job. She said to me, you know what? They don't take EBT cards at Wells Fargo. I need that cash to pay my car payment. That's not fraud. That's using it for what it needs to be used for. So don't go after those people. Go after the people that we're talking about that are abusing it, the people who want to use it to get bailed out of bailed out of jail. Absolutely, go after that. We pay people in the state payroll to go after them. But don't hurt the people that need it, the people that truly are using it for transition. And her prior stance would have absolutely hurt those people. It would have hurt grandparents that through no fault of their own have custody of their grandchildren. Sit in the, sit in the probate court for a couple of days and you'll see it. And a lot of those grandparents are scraping by on their own. And they need that cash not just to be able to, to swipe the EBT in other places, they need the cash because all of a sudden they have a child in their home that they may not have had, so there may be needs. There may be needs for, for summer camp. And if you've, if you've gone past the time to apply and get a subsidy for summer camp, 
You need cash to pay for it. Oh, speaking of uh, going past the time. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, no, it's, I, I, it's, it's just no, we're having a conversation. And about the other side of that, as you can see. Absolutely. And I appreciate your thoughts. And I'm just mindful of the clock. Um, so we are getting to, to the end of our, of our time here. Um, Lisa, did you have any questions that you wanted to pose or should we? Um, I do have a quick question if we have time. Sure. Um, and, and maybe one that is a little bit more about style, um, although I think, I, I think it, it speaks um, uh, to perhaps an integrity and character. Um, I, sitting on this side of the table, I have to tell both of you, um, uh, listening to the way that you address one another is decidedly, at least for me, was decidedly uncomfortable. Um, I'm wondering why you allowed, have allowed your campaigns to descend to the level of, of personal attacks, of trying to get people, you know, one another on whether it was a million or billion, or, or saying, um, you know, making accusations, listening to, to the response, and then, and then just saying what the accusation was again, rather than really listening to one another. I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering why you chose to do that. I'll respond first if that's okay. That'd be great. And, and I, you know, I apologize if that's the way I'm coming across, and I, that's not what I ever want to do. Um, I have two pieces that I put out for my campaign. The first one was just all about me, who I am. The second one that just came out recently just compares our voting record. Nothing personal. It's never been personal. Um, so I, you know, I'm sorry if that's what I'm projecting, and I really need to work on that because that's that's not who I am, and that's not who I want to be. And my only, I, I will never talk about anything that Shauna has done before she became a state rep. I'll only talk about her voting record. That's I promised myself that. And as someone who's had, um, you know, I've received public records requests, you know, not from the, I don't think it's right from Shauna, but it's from the state GOP and it's, you know, and, and records requests of my birth certificate, my marriage certificate, my family member's birth, you know, death certificate. You know, I've released records for my, for my UMass transcript and my Suffolk transcript. So I understand what you're saying. And, and, you know, in my campaign, the first thing they thought to do is, well, we should go after her transcript. I, that's not me. I, I don't, the only issue I have with the representative right now is her voting record. And, and I'm concerned about that. And so if I get passionate about that, I, I mean no disrespect and I mean no disrespect to Shauna. When I was, a, when I was the council president, I emailed her and notified her of, of all of the, the activities that were happening in the, on the city council. And she attended a lot of the things that I had scheduled. To me, it's, it's simply a matter of the voting record, absolutely. And, and I, I will do some deep thinking about what you said because that really concerns me because it's not personal at all to me. It's really about the voting record. Um, so I, I thank you for that, Im that input. And I apologize if I'm, anything I'm doing is making anyone on the other side of the table feel uncomfortable because that's not my intent. Thank you. Representative? Sure. So when we started the campaign, um, I have tried to remain positive the whole entire time, put out press releases that are about positive stuff, and um, just not answer the attacks. Uh, I've sent out two positive mailers. Um, the first debate, uh, I tried to stay positive, but had to answer. I mean, you have to fight back when somebody starts attacking you. Um, the second debate, Sherry came out swinging. I had to swing back. You know, these are the mailers that are being mailed out against me, all negative mailers uh, by Ms. Costa Hanlon Those aren't mine. And, um, or by special interest groups that support her. All negative. And these are awful mailers that just are untruthful. And I have to be able to defend myself against that. Um, so I've been positive, I've stayed positive, and I'm just trying to defend myself against negative attacks that are untrue. And, uh, you know, likewise, uh, I, my apologies if anyone's uncomfortable, but that's what it's come down to. I feel that I've been forced to answer um, negative attacks, and, you know, there's a lot of inconsistencies in this campaign that need to be pointed out. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Great. Well, with the conclusion of the formal uh, Q&A session, we promised the candidates an opportunity to respond to anything that may have come up during the session that they'd like to respond to. So briefly, if there are any you know, unanswered questions, any concerns that you'd like to, to quickly point out. Um, this is time to do it. Otherwise, we'll do that. So I quite a... It's been pretty, pretty vigorous, yeah. Okay, so everyone's fine with that then? 
Great. Well, I'd like to thank Sean O'Connell and uh, Sherry Costa Hanlon for joining us today. Uh, this new open approach to our endorsement process is intended to allow our editorial board to and our readers to uh, fairly compare the candidates and provide a more accurate picture of how the candidates' style and substance stack up uh, right next to each other. And so I hope we've accomplished that today. Uh, we'll keep our readers posted on when to look for our endorsement editorials. And if you have any questions or comments on today's debate or meeting, please feel free to voice them uh, on Twitter or Facebook at taunton to go And on behalf of everyone here at the Taunton Daily Gazette, thank you, and remember to vote on November 6th. Have a good day. Thank you, Thomas.